Hello and welcome back to Typical City. I am not done being happy. I'm not finished being happy yet. What a marvellous weekend of football that was for Manchester City fans. 3-2 from 2-1 down away at St James's Park. It's absolutely freezing outside here in Manchester, but that will not destroy my mood. I'm in too good a mood and I wanted to share my happiness with you wonderful Manchester City fans because I'm not done being happy. I'm not done talking about Kevin De Bruyne and there is a of course, one player that's been not quite ignored, a little bit swept under the rug, a little bit... Uh, it's, it's, I feel harsh. Oscar Bob has been sensational this season. I really believe this. I, I'm not going to stop talking about this kid. I think if you're going to watch this channel, you're going to have to get used to me talking about Oscar Bob because I am a big fan of this kid. I think he's got huge, huge amount of potential, but there's no denying that the main man to talk about right now is, of course, Kevin De Bruyne. The fear factor is the main issue that I want to talk about, that he's going to instill into our rival fans' way of thinking. If they weren't already scared of Manchester City, then Kevin De Bruyne coming on the pitch and within five minutes putting it into the back of the net. Absolutely sensational. Because it isn't, like I said, it's not just the result. It's the long-term ramifications of, right, well, that was one game. That was 25 minutes. What's he going to do when he starts? How's Ke How are City going to play when Kevin De Bruyne is fully bedded back into this side? Because that was him just being slowly dipped in the water a little bit. Pep said it himself. He doesn't want to start him. He's not ready for full 90 minutes. But if that's what he can do in 25 minutes as a substitute appearance, then God help the fucking rest of them when we start playing him from the very first minute of the game. Because Kevin De Bruyne will start pulling strings left, right and centre. And this is all the while without Erling Haaland up top. Manchester City have got 13 days of rest as well. So it's a, a perfect scenario for the, for the likes of Erling Haaland to come back and start playing sooner than we hoped in terms of the, the between two fixtures. Kevin De Bruyne has now got a lovely resting period for him. Edison's got a huge resting period with Pep saying it's a knock. It's nothing too serious, apparently. That's the first verdict from Pep. He said he hadn't spoke to the doctors in truth. So there's a little quick update for, for you regarding Edison. Hopefully he can be fit enough to start in the FA Cup game on the 26th of January against Spurs. I'm doing a watch long for that, so come and join me for that one. It's going to be a good one. And that's a that'll be a huge game as well. I know it's a totally different competition, um, but if we can go away to Spurs and shake that monkey off our back, that, that voodoo that Spurs seem to have on us right now, um, and for, for years they've been able to do that to us. If we can go there, beat them in their own ground and get rid of that scenario that we always fear Spurs 1-0 after we dominate the whole game but Son or Kane as it used to be used to just pop up with a goal out of nothing and we'd lose the game if we can go there and beat Spurs getting further in, into the FA Cup that will send a message that's uh, a very unpalatable message for the rest of the Premier League and one that's incredibly exciting for Manchester City fans but we do need to be a little bit mindful of how the fixtures are falling this season because there's a your turn, my turn, sort of. It seems to be a bit of a, a turn-based Premier League season so far with that wasn't effectively our game in hand against Newcastle. Our game in hand officially is Brentford. So by the time we next play, we could find ourselves fourth in the Premier League and that, that could suddenly feel very bad. But if Liverpool fail to beat Bournemouth... If they do not beat Bournemouth uh, the, on the 21st of January this weekend when City aren't playing at all, if they don't beat Bournemouth, they'll go three points ahead of us, by which time, if we do beat Burnley, when we next kick a Premier League football and win that match against Burnley, we could find ourselves top before Liverpool play the following day on the Sunday after we play Burnley. So it could suddenly flip on the head and we could see a lot of that this season. That's an indication of how tight it is up top. At the top of the Premier League, it's getting really bunched with Spurs, Villa, City, Arsenal, Liverpool, all involved in a, in a close radius within one another. But I do, I, I still believe that Manchester City, over the course of the season, if we continue to play like we did against Newcastle, because it isn't just the result. I thought in the first half we played better than we did in the second half. I thought that, that we restricted Newcastle to, to virtually no chances at all to speak of in the second half. A frustrating defensive 
moments, lapses of concentration, a little bit, a few sloppy passes in, in the attacking. Uh, it was just past the halfway line from Ruben Diaz and Gavardiol was able to give Newcastle an opportunity to hit us on the break. Kyle Walker's defending was a little bit susceptible, susceptible in one moment of that game. Other than that, though, I felt like we were pretty solid at the back. I thought Ortega came on and he produced some good saves. Distribution was a little bit questionable. But overall, the whole grand scheme of that game, I thought City were by far the best side. And there was that little lull in quality from City from the from the start of the second half till probably about five minutes before Kevin De Bruyne came onto the pitch. And when he came onto that pitch, it just went up a notch, didn't it? The whole feel, like the feel-good factor for Manchester City and the fear factor for Newcastle. I said it in the watch-along, talking about it, I said... There's a there's a psychological element to not starting Kevin De Bruyne because you see him at the start, you think you mentally prepare for it as a player. You see the starting eleven, Kevin De Bruyne is on that starting eleven. We need to mentally prepare for that. But that wasn't the case. At 2 1, City were peppering and, and creating potential opportunities. Alvarez had an opportunity to to make it 2-2, we had all other opportunities to make it 2-2 before Kevin De Bruyne even comes onto the pitch. But then you raise that board in the air and number 17, Kevin De Bruyne, is coming onto the pitch. You could almost hear the silence and the, the gasps of air, the sharp intake of breath from Newcastle fans going, oh. Just Kevin De Bruyne is coming onto the pitch with some lovely, luxurious... I'm pretty sure he's had his, uh, some sort of hair like operation or something. There's no way his hair suddenly become that luxuriant. It's fantastic hair that he's suddenly modelling for his uh, uh, end of his Manchester City days because, I mean, he is approaching 32, 33 now. So, and that's an element I wanted to talk about as well because... I think his approach to the game might have to shift. We did see... Uh, what I saw from Kevin De Bruyne in the way he played that game in those 25 minutes that he came on for, he was very delicate but very deliberate with his movement. I thought he he didn't run around like a headless chicken. He picked his moments. I saw him do a couple of overlaps to get some crosses in where he really showed his speed and he didn't seem to have lost that much speed. He was bursting past um, Dan Byrne at times on the overlap and he was being fed and he was getting some nice crosses in. Crosses that weren't met by a City player but we need, we need to get used to him being on the pitch. The rest of the players now need to understand what this player is capable of and remind ourselves they all have, will have memories of what Kevin De Bruyne is capable of and of course they'll see it during training as well. But on the pitch we need to start making those runs again and making sure that we try the difficult run because there's Kevin De Bruyne who wants to make that pass for you. Oscar Bob, for example, that run that he makes, Kevin De Bruyne picks the ball up, and this is a huge feather in the cap for Manchester City going forward now, is the amount of times we come up against a low block, a team that will present a, a, a wall of 10 men in front of us to beat. Whoever it is, we seem to come up against a low block that all they want to do is defend, 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 hit us on the counter-attack. And at times it's worked for opposition teams this season because we haven't had that ability to pick a lock quite as well as Kevin De Bruyne is able to do that because the way he can pick a lock is just unprecedented. It's unrivaled, unmatched. You can't, no one can do what he can do. The way he picks that ball and just nonchalantly just dinks it over the top of the whole defence, just the whole Newcastle team, bar Trippier, just watching this ball lofted over everybody's head. Trippier shitting himself, running back, and he's just realised, and then guess whose foot it lands right on? Oscar Bob's touch was absolutely delicious. And the way he just brings it down and knocks it past Dubravka and pokes it into that empty net, the footwork was sensational, but it's all about the pass. To, to even make that opportunity happen. Without Kevin De Bruyne, that would never have happened. The game would have... Well, I mean, I don't, God knows what the game would have finished had not had Kevin De Bruyne not been able to come on. But these are the fine details and the fine margins that we're talking about right now as Manchester City fans because they, they, they matter, these details. And a player to... When we talk about the word, the word and the terminology of world-class... The amount of times I hear players being called world-class, Trent Alexander-Arnold is world-class at delivery, but is he a world-class player for what he is as his position? Not just Kevin, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold. Uh, there's so many players that get c called world-class, okay? And if that's the case, then what's Kevin De Bruyne? What, if he's not world-class, then I got, I that's why I called him a god. 
He's a footballing god because if everyone else in this massive category of what is now being called world class, so many players are called world class, then Kevin De Bruyne is in a league of his own is a god tier. That has to be his own tier because, I mean, there's no one that can do what he can do. It's scary. It's scary. And there's very few people. There was one comment I saw on the video that I rem and I haven't mentioned it myself until now. He put it through Fabian Shah's legs when he scored. He nutmegged the centre-back. That Newcastle shape, you go back and watch the goal. Dan Byrne starts to think, I'm coming over. Coming over to, to get across the run of Kevin De Bruyne after being found in that beautiful pocket of space by Rodri. Lovely ball from Rodri, that was. Kevin De Bruyne turns with a nice pocket of space to turn. Run at the back four, back five, back, back eight at times it was, to be honest, wasn't it? But Dan Byrne's defending was brilliant. He came across and to, to sort of deter Kevin De Bruyne away a little bit. But then he says, no, Fabian Shah, you've got this. And he did. His shape was fantastic. The Newcastle shape was set up. No problem. There's no real danger here. And it's a case of, go on then, if you think you're good enough, have a shot. Because, you, I, I mean, the chances of you scoring from there are, are pretty slim. But this is Kevin De Bruyne. And slim chances is all he needs. He only needs a scrap. He only needs the tiniest of narrow angles to find and he will find it with ease. He'll make the game look like the simplest of games in the world. And at times it is. We do overcomplicate things as football fans and football players. But I mean, Kevin De Bruyne, just, he just made it look so, so simple. And to see Fabian Shah, the way he dipped his shoulder, was about to, he looked like he was about to curve it onto his left foot to indicate that he's about to try and whip it in that corner rather than the bottom left. And he pull it onto his left foot and I was expecting that Chelsea left foot strike in the purple kit that we wore when we went to Stamford Bridge and battered Chelsea 1-0 because that was a battering as well. A Kevin De Bruyne masterclass in that game as well. I was expecting him to pull it onto his left foot and drill it. But the, the movement that he did, it was almost like a, a double bluff. Like he, he made it look like he was about to dummy it, but he actually didn't. And he passed it right into that bottom corner and right through the legs of Fabian Shah, whose defensive shape was spot on. Nothing you can do about it, mate. You can't close your legs at that speed. The level of precision we're talking about here is through the roof. It is. It's hole-in-one standards if you don't talk about golf. You talk about a duck in cricket. You talk about a Hail Mary in NFL. You, any sport in the world where an ace in tennis, any sort of moment, that's what Kevin De Bruyne just did with a goal like that. It's that level of precision and the rarity of goals like that. But he makes it look like he does it every week. You know what I mean? He makes it look so easy. So easy. And... One thing that really frustrated me about that game was the celebrations and the accusations of City over-celebrating. For the first time, I've seen City celebrate hard, deservedly so. Deservedly so. That was a monumental game of football. Hugely important. So paramount to the rest of the season. We had to win that game in that scenario from 2-1 down. I mean, it was brilliant to, to see those celebrations. I have no embarrassment from a City perspective looking at the way we celebrated. Good. Fucking let them know. Let them know how happy we are. Because the most of the time, we just get on with it. We win games like that, and we just go, ah, oh, crack on. Anyway, go and applaud the away fans, as always we do. The, the, the amazing support that we have. Go and applaud them up in the gods at St. James's Park. I've been there many a time myself, to, and I know how high up it is, and the view that they get isn't the greatest. Go and applaud them, and then go back in and have a chat about how things went and what the plans are for the next week. But no, they celebrated hard, and rightly so. It was only two or three weeks ago, everybody in the, uh, every man and his dog was questioning Manchester City and our mentality. Oh, that's it now. Have they got a treble hangover? Complacency. They, are, they, they, they aren't creating enough chances. All of this stuff about our mentality and our well-being and how much hunger do Manchester City have. I've even heard City fans, I heard uh, uh, numerous City fans saying that at 2-1 down, they, they were done. I've seen, I've seen it. I'm not going to name names, but I've seen it. City two one down. I'm done. Finished. I'm finished with the team. I mean, how many times do we need this team to prove the doubters wrong? And we've got plenty of doubters within our own fan base. Sadly, as if we haven't learned lessons by now, Blues. As if we haven't learned lessons by now. Unbelievable to write this team off at two one down. I was saying it from half time. We're going to turn this round. You go back and watch the watch along. I was saying we're turning this round because I believe in this team. Pep himself, he's the man. If, if, if Pep trusts the players, I trust the players. The moment Pep Guardiola 
doesn't trust his players or comes out like he did two or three years ago when he, after a West Brom draw and he said, I do not recognise my team. I don't recognise my team. I panicked at that moment, but we still went on and won the fucking league that year, that year, which is unbelievable. For Pep to bring the players in, have a team meeting and do all that, what he did, is incredible. But I have so much confidence because he even said it himself after the FIFA Club World Cup that he was sat at the front of the plane on the way back from Saudi Arabia and he heard his players talking about Everton. They've got the FIFA Club World Trophy, like all passing it around the plane, passing it from seat to seat, player to player, enjoy having a look, give it a quick kiss. But none of that. They're all talking about Everton, the next game. How are we going to beat Everton? And the players are doing that off their own back. Pep's not saying you need to all think about Everton. They're doing it on their own. Because this group has matured, they've grown together, they, they, they've they've moulded, they've become a, a, a tank, a unit, a solidified United team. And not in the, the, the modern term of United, not in the footballing term of United, because that's shite. <laughs> Manchester United means nothing now. Manchester disjointed, if anything. We're the United team in Manchester. We are the one United team in Manchester. And thankfully, we're called Manchester City. And we are on our way to doing wondrous things. We absolutely are. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I'm not done there either because I want to talk about Oscar Bob because I do feel like he was brushed under the carpet a little bit, a little bit harshly because, I mean, the, I loved his face, man. That ball goes into the back of the net. You could just see the raw passion and emotion being poured out of his face when he scored that goal. Rodri was just shaking him like, oh, you love it. Absolutely love to see it. And I think this guy is on his way to being a genuine superstar. And it is a shame we didn't get to talk about him as much as we would have. I would have liked to have talked about him. I would have liked to have seen the media talk about him a lot more than they did. But it's understandable when it's Kevin De Bruyne. So he just had to bide his time again a little bit because I'm sure he was expecting or hoping for a few more positive headlines. And he got he got recognition. It's just that if it wasn't Kevin De Bruyne who was passing him that ball, we would be talking about Oscar Bob. And I'm incredibly excited. I said it again. I love being proved right. I'm not going to pretend I don't. Who doesn't being love, enjoy being proved right? But uh, two days before this game, I made a video about how I'd have zero regrets about Cole Palmer, mainly because of Oscar Bob. That's why I have zero regrets. And I was proved right again, thankfully. <laughs> like Oscar Bob proving me right. Thanks, Oscar Bob. Appreciate that. And I did want to prove his uh, stats, put his stats on the screen for you as well. Just uh, quickly there, because this is from 23-24, 14 appearances, 453 minutes so far, which is, I mean, 300 or so of those are substitute appearances. He's only had one proper start, and that was in the League Cup um, against Newcastle, which we lost that game as well. Two goals, two assists, six big chances created, and successful dribble percentage completion of 82%. That's incredibly high. That's incredibly high. And it's not like he hasn't tried to take on players either. He's such a dynamic player. And the key factor I wanted to highlight, and one of my biggest criticisms of Cole Palmer, was always his decision-making. But this guy's got a, a footballing IQ that's unprecedented at that age. He seems to know when to dribble and when to pass and when to shoot. And he rarely gets it wrong. And to have that level of understanding and maturity at the age of 20 is frightening. It's frightening. And I mean, the touch and composure as well. And the big, big Premier League stage, 90th minute, to control the ball like that and then bang, bang between his two feet and pop it into an empty net. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We can't forget that we were. he was unlucky not to get an assist in the game before against Huddersfield. He, he comes on and he ends up being an own goal um, to make it 5-0. But that, when it clipped off the bar, but that was an attempted assist that was well on course for Kevin De Bruyne to get a, an instant impact for his first return for Manchester City first team in the FA Cup in the 5-0 win against Huddersfield. That was Oscar Bob to Kevin De Bruyne. This time against Newcastle, we've seen Kevin De Bruyne to Oscar Bob. So could there be a bit of link-up play? I've always said Oscar Bob's very much reminds me of Leroy Sane, an even more mature version of Leroy Sane, because I don't think Leroy Sane was doing this at the age of 20. No way. Leroy Sane is an incredible player, but I'm not sure he was that level at 20. Players grow at different levels, but I always remember the link-up play and the, 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 the telepathic connection between Kevin De Bruyne and Leroy Sane. Could we be about to see the same thing with Kevin De Bruyne and Oscar Bob? Because these guys seem on the same level. On the same level at all times, which is fantastic news. But I mean, you could say that about anyone and Kevin De Bruyne, because he seems to find anyone. That telepathic connection between Kevin De Bruyne and Jack Grealish, Kevin De Bruyne and Erling Haaland, Kevin De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva, he'll find anyone, Kevin De Bruyne. So we could it could be an easy comparison to make because Kevin De Bruyne is Kevin De Bruyne. 
Um, but it, it, it's an, an incredible prospect. And Norway as well, they must be laughing all the way to the bank. Haaland, Odegaard, and now Oscar Bob. That's three incredible Premier League talents that are in the, uh, the Norway international side. I also wanted to bring up his stats for last season, just a reminder of City fans of what this guy's all about. Because Oscar Bob in last season's Premier League 2, the under-21s, under-23s effectively, um, last season Oscar Bob, 25 appearances, 2,149 minutes, 10 goals, 15 assists with a minute per goal ratio of 215 minutes and 143 minutes uh, per assist, which, I mean, that's 25 goal involvements in 25 games. So you can see why he came into the first team pretty quickly. It was cheeky who were people, uh, people who were telling... Uh, and stating hashtag cheeky out on Twitter and nonsense like that. I've heard it throughout the summer as well. Cheeky out. Cheeky's the one who said, we're not going into the market because this kid is going into the first team, Pep. He's good enough. Pep said, okay, okay, Cheeky, I trust you. And trust was very well placed because Oscar Bob is proving his worth right now. And in fact, Manchester City, who are currently bottom of the Premier League 2, they won the Premier League 2 last season. They cantered to the Premier League 2, demolished that division. Now we're bottom, and I think that's because of the transition of players. Micah Hamilton, Sosoho, Oscar Bob, all these wonderful talents being promoted into the first team, leaving the under-23s in the Premier League 2 squad a little bit short. And we find ourselves rock bottom of the Premier League right too as a result of that. But that just shows the importance of these players and how good they actually were and how much they were delivering at the, the, the standards below the first team. But they're not looking poor, in particular Oscar Bob, now that they've stepped up another level. Because Oscar Bob goes and scores a Premier League winner, a, a fantastic three points for Manchester City in the Premier League, a vital Premier League three points that will prove to be at the end of the season. I, I have every belief that we'll look back at this as a historic moment for this particular season at least but what do you think what do you think about Kevin De Bruyne I have a good feeling that you're going to say some good things in the comment sections about Kevin De Bruyne what do you think about Oscar Bob where do you think his ceiling is get in the comment sections below I want to hear your thoughts like and subscribe Typical City is the channel and I'll see you in the next one this is Typical City now holding up so